Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, and this is Open Line First Monday, or the first week of the month for those of you uh, overseas, which this is actually a different day of the week. Uh, this is that program of our series in which we open the phone lines and the emails as soon as we can, as soon as you have a phone call or email that's pertinent to our discussion. Our, dis our questions tonight for the guest really center on any aspect of the journey, following Jesus Christ, uh, life in the church, following Christ and, uh, and his teachers, and about the questions of faith. And I know that there are e we have emails that have been here for a while that we haven't had, had a chance to get to, so we'd like to get as many of your questions in as we can tonight. Let me give you right off the bat the phone number. It's 1-800-221-9460, and the email is journeyhome at ewtn.com. Our guest for tonight is Father James Garneau. He's become a good friend, and it's a friendship that I greatly appreciate. He's the interim rector at the Pontifical College Joseph Seminary Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio. He's also the dean, the academic dean there. Uh, Father is a lifelong Catholic, but he's here to answer your questions, but also to talk about his own journey of faith. So, Father Garneau, welcome to the journey home. Thank you, Marcus, very it's much. It's good to get you here. It's good to be here. It really is. You know, I will admit right off the bat that one of the reasons, besides having you here to share your journey and answer questions is that there's so many great things happening at the Josephinum that I wanted the home audience to know more about this one unique seminary in it America. Is. So get a chance is. to talk about that. But if we could, let's begin right off the bat, ask you to share a little bit of your, your lifelong Catholic. I am. But talk am. about your journey of faith. It's, uh, every journey is unique and uh, mine uh, has taken me to so many different places. I'm, uh, I consider myself truly blessed and uh, quite fortunate. I grew up in Long Island, New York. I uh, became a priest of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I had gone to school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and uh, was ordained for that diocese and find myself in Columbus, Ohio now in this <laughs> work of uh, seminary education. Uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, quite a switch for me. I plan to be a uh, uh, parish priest and uh, find myself a, a, a seminary educator and it's uh, unexpected but joyful. <laughs> Patricia. Let's jump way back. Did you go through all the usual hoops that Catholics went through, the, the conveyor I belt? I, 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 it was a conveyor belt in many ways, but an important conveyor belt. I, I, probably my, my first very conscious awareness of, of Jesus uh, as, as, as my God, my Lord, um, was with my first confession and first communion. Uh, it, it sounds almost idyllic, but it was true, and I don't think I'm alone in that. That's, that's what you want to happen at that, in those rites of passage. Sure, and, and I'm old enough, I, I, I'm, I'm 46, and I'm old enough that uh, uh, the sisters I had for um, uh, CCD, I, I went to public school uh, through grammar school, and the uh, sisters I had uh, gave me a profound sense, I think gave a lot of us a profound sense of uh, the presence of Christ in, uh, in through the sacraments and the life of the church. Um, the church was an important place for me, and it uh, grew. Um, I was in public school until sixth grade. My parents placed a high uh, priority on education, um, for which I'm grateful, uh, but it brought them to send me to a, um, a Protestant junior high school, uh, Episcopalian school for boys, um, good strong educational values, which even at that young age may be asked, well, why am I Catholic and why are they all Episcopalian <laughs> and other Protestant communities? And uh, I asked questions. I um, remember making an appointment with a priest uh, to ask a number of questions of differences that I had noted and already it started to uh, sink deep in me, I think, um, uh, the importance of, uh, for me of being Catholic. Um, and uh, uh, I asked my parents if I could go to a Catholic high school. And uh, they, they supported that. There was an excellent Catholic high school not too far away. Um, and I did. And then I went to a state uh, university, so I've been to public education, Protestant education, and Catholic education, <laughs> and um, found the Lord present in each of those stages along the way, and grateful for it. Um, you know, every week we usually have a convert or a revert, someone that's left the church and come back on the program. Uh, and Catholics will often say it's those converts that keep us alive, you know, that inspire. <laughs> but talk a bit about the importance of continued conversion anyway, out of your own experience, but also from the work you're doing now. Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 the concept and the reality of the need for continuing conversion is uh, very real to me. Yeah. And uh, uh, to know uh, that uh, I'm constantly falling short of that goal, I, I feel it profoundly. I can uh, main moments that I wish I could redo and I can't, but counting on God's mercy and His grace to learn and to grow, 
uh, I move on to the next moment and have found that uh, he keeps calling me to, to be transformed, uh, to be uh, more conformed to Christ, uh, to put on the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, in each of the contexts and the circumstances and the ministries and the apostolates in which he's placed me. And uh, he keeps trying to reform me <laughs> desperately, I think. Uh, and uh, sometimes I pay attention, I try to. Uh, sadly, I look back sometimes and say, you weren't paying attention at all. <laughs> and uh, it's then when he's got me that I can then ask for his mercy. In the context of the seminary, um, I think, um, all, if not all, most of those young men know that uh, Christ's continuing, sustaining love uh, calling them to constant conversion is um, going to be their lifeblood, not only in the seminary, but as priests. Um, and uh, I remember um, Bishop Earl Boyer, he was the uh, former rector of the Josephinum, now an auxiliary bishop in Detroit, uh, in the first homily that he gave when I had just arrived at the seminary a little over two and a half years ago, uh, told the new men there, welcome to the Josephinum, uh, the house of conversion. And uh, I, I was pretty convinced he was talking to me <laughs> as a new faculty member. Uh, this was going to be a house of conversion. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that uh, whatever house we're in, we need to make that house a house of conversion for us. Yeah, especially in the case of the priests, you know, you, first of all, you can't give what you don't got. That's right. That's right. A and, and the danger of burnout if you don't continue to feed the pot. I remember I used to think of, of conversion as, as our uh, our life as Christians as channels. Right. You know, we take God's love and it flows through. But then I remember reading something in the Soul of the Apostolate in which I think it was St. Benedict says, no, 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 no. We're not to be channels. We're to be reservoirs. The overflow of that reservoir. And to me, isn't that what seminary is really all about? Is helping them to understand that reservoir and how to keep filling it in their calling. Sure. And, and if you will, just to uh, modify the the analogy to swim in that reservoir and to uh, to be baptized and to be renewed in it, uh, and when the uh, the heat of the day is uh, is uh, really bringing us down to be refreshed by it, uh, it's, uh, it's it's you're right. The Holy Father, uh, in his one of his first efforts, uh, uh, in terms of writing and in terms of uh, program, was to uh, reform the seminaries. Uh, he knew how important that was, and it's always important and it's got to be a constant work of the church. And in a magnificent letter he wrote, Pastores da Vobis, uh, I give you pastors. Uh, uh, and uh, he writes about the four pillars of formation, uh, which we um, uh, cling to and we found our seminary program on those four pillars. That formation has to include all of these things, simultaneously and continuously. Uh, and not only for the seminarian, I think, but uh, for the priest and, dare I say, for the Christian people. The first pillar, if you will, human formation. Uh, grace builds on nature, and uh, the human person needs to be addressed as a human person. And those um, pains in our lives, those flaws in our lives, those struggles in our lives can't be ignored. Uh, they need to be dealt with by all the means that God's given us, uh, by wisdom, uh, the wisdom of the human community, as well as wisdom of the Christian community. And so the, the human person uh, growing uh, as, a, as a person. Intellectual um, formation, that uh, God's given us minds and we're meant to use them. And the young man who aspires to be a priest needs to fill that mind with the wisdom of the church, with the wisdom of the gospel, so that he can be a reservoir for others. And uh, um, pastoral formation, so the man in the seminary who wants to serve God's people as a parish priest needs to learn the skills of a pastor. Uh, and uh, how to develop those skills and stay alive with them so they don't become old and root and uh, uh, insipid. Uh, and uh, spiritual formation. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that's the last. In fact, at a different time in our life, each one might need to be first. They all need to be simultaneous, we might say. To know Jesus and to be uh, constantly renewed in Christ um, and to know how to uh, live a life of uh, prayer and to help others grow in prayer. Yeah. I think priests uh, need to be teachers of prayer uh, more than ever uh, in our day. Uh, sometimes we used to, uh, I think, uh, leave that to uh, family, uh, of course, ought to be, but often isn't, yeah. or to uh, communities of religious men and women, sisters, brothers, yeah. that aren't uh, there sometimes in the numbers they used to be. And so it's the parish priest who needs to be the teacher of prayer. But he needs to be a man of prayer himself. 
So those four pillars, the, the human, the intellectual, the pastoral, the spiritual, um, become the foundation for seminary formation. Now, I look at, listen to those four pillars. I'm going to ask a question thinking back on my Protestant background. Sure. When I went to seminary, it was Bible. Four pillars were all based on the Bible. Yeah. You know, in terms of there was the Bible up front. I got it right here. And that was the foundation. Of, I think every course I took, whether it was pastoral counseling, preaching, education, uh, theology, it was really basically open the Bible and study this. Sure. All right. I also have a couple books on my shelf. I have a book of the conversion stories of 50 priests who left the priesthood to become Protestants, and 20 nuns that left the priest left the the, the nun nunnery to uh, the religious life to become uh, Protestants. And almost every story they said that somebody outside told them about Jesus, but often told them about the Bible, which they never read before. Yeah. Which in my mind is absurd. Where's the Bible in the midst of the a seminary experience for Catholics? It's at the beginning of the day, it's in the middle of the day, it's at the end of the day. Uh, the men are immersed in scriptural prayer, uh, morning prayer, evening prayer, the midday prayer in our seminary is the Eucharist. Um, we preach uh, and we uh, teach. And uh, the scripture courses are certainly there as part of an academic formation, uh, but the other programs, the other courses are meant to be imbued with the Word of God, uh, with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that um, at times and in places in the past, um, that uh, gospel message was systematized in a way that took it one step away from the living word itself. And so men and women with great sincerity trying to create a, a system of education out of the gospel sometimes uh, put the gospel so much in their own words, their own categories, that the living word was less apparent and then therefore less uh, effective. And so to systematize the faith uh, so that it can be shared and can be explored by category and by structure is significant and helpful, but never divorced from the living word of God. Yeah. And that alive in our own hearts, that on the page of the text in front of us, that on our lips yeah. in the prayer of the community, in our ears by the preaching of the faculty, and uh, those that we bring in to uh, supplement that, other preachers and, and, uh, and teachers. You know, I can guarantee, and I went, my experience, at an evangelical, one of the, the best recognized evangelical Protestant seminaries in America, that I can guarantee that, that what I've seen at, at Catholic seminaries like the Josephinum is we really didn't have that much, as, as much scripture. We would have it in classes, we would have it as a foundation for our pastoral counseling, let's say. But in the liturgy, and as a foundation for the prayer life is uh, so solid in, in that way that I've seen at Josephine. It's very powerful. Sure, the first thing the men are doing when they get up is uh, yeah. entering into private prayer, we hope, and uh, uh, many of them immersing themselves in the gospel of the day. Uh, when we gather for that first community prayer early in the morning, it's the uh, words of the Psalms on our lips as we sing them. Uh, and again, at the middle of the day, the, the Eucharist itself and those readings and preaching. And then at the end of the day, uh, the evening prayer and night prayer and then devotional prayer that men gather with in small groups and the rosary and the, it's constant. Uh, the kind, it's we, constant. We, we hope it is. And I, I've been starting to see it even in some Protestant seminaries where, you know, in the New Testament theology classes and some of those, you would talk more about the scripture than looking into the scripture itself. You might read Boltmann, Bart, and Perrin and some of these books yeah. and read those about scripture as opposed to scripture itself. And I, I do see there was a time when that was really growing. But as I've been at the Josephina myself, I see this emphasis on the, on the word itself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the word that needs to be explored and can never be uh, let go without making believe that the further reflections of the saints and the wise ones in the Christian yeah. community, um, that, that they haven't, to imagine that they haven't given us more insights and uh, helpful perspectives and understanding. In fact, they have. Mm -hmm. and to, to, to reap from that harvest yeah. without losing direct contact. You know, to, to learn about other people's journeys with the Lord yeah. uh, is, is, is key, but of course, you can't lose focus on your own journey. As a matter of fact, you know, when I learned the, the, uh, uh, the hours and all those uh, morning and midday and evening uh, readings, all from Scripture, right. you know, reflections of all the Psalms, and, but actually the part of it that was newest to me as a convert was the Office of Reading. Yeah. What a, a gem that is because of the selections every single day from the fathers of the church yeah. connected with all the other readings. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that, that even laity, of course, are encouraged 
to, re to use and to reflect on. Sure, so horrible. Of gift. course. Faith and reason. Yeah. And uh, the Lord's given us a mind and he's given us a heart. He's given us a soul and we're to uh, fill it and to each, each aspect and so that we're filled entirely with, with Christ. Before we take our first emails, could you take some time to talk specifically about this jewel of the Josephinum here in the United States? Yeah, it's uh, been a, a gift in my life. I, I arrived there a little over two and a half years ago. I, uh, I'm an alumnus of, a, of an East Coast seminary. Um, I'm ordained uh, over 18 years now, and um, I arrived as a professor of church history. And I uh, find myself now in a leadership role as interim rector and uh, academic dean. The seminary was founded uh, by a German immigrant uh, who came to the United States after service as a soldier. Um, and uh, he became. In the 1800s, right? Uh, towards the latter part of the 1800s. Okay. And he uh, became a priest. Uh, his name was Joseph Jessing. And uh, was ordained a priest uh, for uh, the Columbus Diocese, a, a new young diocese that had been broken off from Cincinnati. He found in a, a home for orphans. Uh, so many of the uh, immigrant uh, fathers uh, had uh, died in their work or in the journey across the sea, and they were orphan children. Um, and uh, some of them wanted to be priests as they got older. Mm -hmm. And he had set up a newspaper in order to raise money for the orphanage, and he put it in his newspaper that some of the men wanted to become uh, priests and could some people help them with funds. Well, the funds were so forthcoming from the German immigrants uh -huh. that uh, he hired faculty, and the orphanage became a seminary, little by little. And uh, this seminary was placed under the patronage of the Holy See uh, so that it would have the special protection of the Vatican uh, for years to come as a, as a missionary seminary. It's the only pontifical seminary in all the Americas. But emphasize that again. That's a very unique Even thing. today, it's the only pontifical college uh, in the Americas. Uh, we have a special relationship with the Holy See. We cherish it. Uh, we're in joyful union with the Holy Father and try to um, incarnate in all of our programs um, a, a faithfulness that uh, gives life not only to us as individuals but then to the church. And um, the, uh, the Germanness of the institution has diminished over the years. There's not the need uh, in our time for German-speaking priests throughout the United States. But men come from throughout the United States, sent by their bishops, sent by their diocese. And we also serve, at the request of the Holy See, certain international situations. Um, we've been asked by the Holy See to assist the church in Burma, in Uganda, and right now in Latvia. And we have men from those countries that we educate and then send back home uh, so that they can be teachers uh, and uh, preachers of the faith uh, there, perhaps a little more prepared than they would be if they stayed home. And I, I think you mentioned earlier the Fathers of Mercy. We also have, in addition to the 32 dioceses that are present, 26 American dioceses, six international dioceses, the Fathers of Mercy, uh, a dynamic, uh, yeah. uh, revived uh, religious community uh, whose uh, fundamental charism is to pe preach parish missions. And they're um, recently sending uh, a good number of their men to the Josephinum for formation. We're very happy to have them. And I will say that besides all the good things you're talking about, it's a beautiful place. It is. The, the, the Germans built well, and uh, I, 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 we, it's, it's time for some repairs, and uh, uh, there's always maintenance and upkeep, but it's a solid foundation, uh, both spiritually and physically. And, uh, and even at a time when we do hear that there are other uh, seminary colleges that are closing, the Josephinum is, is holding in there. Right? You know, I, I, I hesitate uh, under the rubric of, you know, you don't want to tempt fate, but I, I don't believe in fate. I believe in the Lord, and I want to give witness to what he's done. He's, um, he's, he's made our, our, the work of our hands prosper. Yeah. And uh, this past year, our enrollment was up over 10% this past year yeah. with all that was happening in the church in this yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. And more young men are coming. And that's a very powerful thing to witness. And uh, of course, calls me again to continual conversion so that I can serve them, that I can be faithful uh, to them yeah. uh, so, because they're asking for so much in a time of such struggle. Yeah. Uh, but the numbers are up. And that's good news. The college program, we have a college program there, which is a, a freestanding, uh, fully accredited College of Liberal Arts. And as you mentioned, that, that's growing. It's, it's almost doubled in the last five or six years. We were down to a, to a, a sad uh, nadir, uh, but it has grown increasingly. We have a pre-theology program uh, for men who've got degrees in other areas, engineers and um, all kinds of different fields, but have an undergraduate degree, but they need philosophy and some undergraduate theology and some Latin in order to move on to uh, theology. And so we have a small program of pre-theologians. And then we have Theologate, which is a graduate school of theology and a seminary formation uh, program in the last four years. 
And so it uh, covers a wide span of ages and uh, places along the journey. A number of converts among them, yeah. um, and uh, uh, men who are discerning their vocation at the beginning of the journey, and those who are just ready to be ordained priests. We ordained 10 men uh, to the diaconate last um, uh, Saturday, and another four from that class in their own diocese, some before us and after this, this past Saturday. So the place is alive. Uh, uh, Christ lives. Well, I, I just give a personal witness because yeah. out of your uh, invitation, I have the opportunity to teach catechetics to s some of the deacons there. And, and what's neat is I'm humbled by their faith. I mean, here I am teaching a class full of, of the collared folk, and uh, I'm humbled by that position. But what's neat about teaching there is I, n I know that I don't have to hold back any of the faith no. to these men or to water it down or to be politically correct. These men are on fire for the Lord Jesus and to serve him as priest. I mean, it's a great... I think that's true. For that. And yeah. uh, you can see that in uh, vocations throughout the country and at many other seminaries as well. Yeah. Um, I, I've written about that in the last months and uh, uh, gotten a lot of feedback on, on, on those writings because uh, people note it and uh, people who are joyful about it and people sometimes who struggle with it uh, from uh, other perspectives. But the fact is that uh, a lot of men have been touched by Christ, are inspired by the Holy Father in his journey, and uh, want to follow, and want to follow Jesus. All right, we have an email here. We might as well uh, take this first one. It comes sure. from Peggy in St. Louis, Missouri. Father, how do you answer my brother who believes we are children of God, not adopted children of God? Talk about the distinction there that might, uh, he might be wrestling with. Yeah, in some ways, Peggy, your brother is, uh, uh, has a point, uh, but it might be uh, uh, such a fine line that uh, this is one of those questions, depending upon what you mean and how he means, that you're both right. Um, sure, we're, we're sons and daughters of God, and the Lord's given us the uh, unique privilege in baptism. And you might even suggest, uh, even in creation, uh, the, the Old Testament refers to this repeatedly, uh, to allow ourselves to be called and to call one another sons and daughters of, of the one Father in heaven, um, and brothers and sisters, therefore, of each other. Baptism uh, does give us this uh, adopted sonship, uh, even after the fall, even after we've lost that initial grace uh, that was uh, bestowed upon us by and through and in creation, uh, when we lost it through sin, uh, the adoption as sons and daughters through and by baptism is God's uh, gift through Jesus Christ. And so in that way we might recognize what St. Paul talks about as uh, the adoption. Um, so both are really correct and point to truths that need to be cherished. In fact, this gets us to um, that aspect of our understanding, Catholic understanding of what salvation means compared yeah. to, let's say, where I came from, which is more of a juridical, you know, you're the man in the box that's guilty, and but you point to Jesus, and because he died for your sins, he covers you with his blood, and you're forgiven because God's not looking at you, he's looking at you. I mean, that's this idea of we're children of God, adopted children of God in his family, forms the, 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 the kernel and foundation for all that we understand of what it means to be saved, Yes. As Catholics. Yeah, that, that the Lord not only looks upon us with his love and not only sees us through the eyes of mercy, which are indeed his, thanks be to God, but that he makes us his loving children um, and then uh, seeks to transform us into uh, a human beings fully alive in Christ, that his lifeblood, if you will, flows through us in grace, uh, that it's not merely an external observance uh, from the perspective of God towards us, but that he really makes us one with him in his love. All right. Okay, I, they're uh, working on an email for us. I think they got a new email program. I said it takes a little bit of tweaking to get it, uh, to get it ready for, for broadcast. We sure. do have, they have one that's almost ready. You know, uh, uh, I will tell the audience that I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, they've seen the email, uh, the, uh, the website for the Josephine. Let me say it for the, those listening on radio. It's www.pcj.edu. That's right. Pontifical College Josephinum, pcj.edu. Yeah, and if you went to that website, you'd find out a lot of information about the, the programs, about 
the history, the photographs, and of uh, the men, their activities, their yeah, work. Yeah, great place. And keep praying for it. I mean, all of our places Please. need our continued yeah. grace. We, uh, for the faculty, yeah. and uh, for those who <laughs> dare to be leadership uh, in these days, and for the students. And uh, be assured of our prayers each day for, for not only the Catholic people, but for the whole world, for our Christian brothers and sisters, and for the whole world yeah. every day. Okay, I think we have an email that looks, it looks like it's still in the editing process, but let's run with it, all right? Well, I think we can uh, hear it. Some, this comes from Francis, <coughs> uh, Marcus. Ask Father James what he thinks of the seminaries that have been failing men who are not politically correct, thus dismissing those who would be good priests. Yeah. Let me keep going. That's one question. Then what does a school about older men who have vocations? And finally, third what about candidates who don't measure to the very highest academic standards? God bless you for your show. Thank you for your question, Francis. Well, thank you, Francis, for your questions, and they're, they're very timely. There's a lot of writing out there about seminaries these days, and it's a varying quality, and we have to be careful uh, how we take it. Uh, Any time that accusations uh, as serious as some of the ones that have been made are, are, are put forth, we need, um, I think, to consider um, carefully uh, sources, um, we need to take stock of what's being said, and if changes need to be made, we need to make those changes with uh, due haste. Um, but we also need to recognize that uh, seminaries are meant to be houses of discernment as well as houses of conversion. And the discernment, whether your man has a vocation or not, takes place really on several levels. A bishop sends, or a religious community sends a candidate to us, and so there's a discernment locally in the local church or in the religious community. We, as faculty, are asked to discern before the Lord, and we have a responsibility before the Lord and on behalf of the church to make judgments. Is this man ready to be ordained? Is this man qualified to be ordained? Not just academically, not intellectually only, which you mentioned, but does he have pastoral skills to do this? Yeah. Does he have the, the depth of spiritual life? And these are very difficult things to judge. There's no doubt about that. We need to make uh, with the best uh, means and deliberations possible, uh, careful judgments. Um, and uh, is a man humanly ready for the responsibilities and the burdens of the pastorate and of the priesthood? So that um, uh, the discernment needs to go on on that level. It also needs to go on, of course, in the heart of the man, that he's asking, God, is this where you want me? Do you want me to step forward? Do you want me to present myself for the next step, for next year? for diaconate, for priesthood. So it's a multi-level reality uh, that has to be constantly at work with each other. Sometimes some of these books have suggested that it's only um, driven by one level or one agenda. I was in the seminary between 1981 and 1984, and um, in many ways the picture wasn't pretty. And I know the fact is that there's still difficulties in many places. No place is going to be perfect. That's true, uh, not this side of the kingdom. <laughs> but, uh, as long as I'm teaching that Joseph <laughs> is not perfect. <laughs> that aside, Marcus, <laughs> that aside. Uh, that uh, we, we, we still have to strive at, at, with earnestness to make the changes that are demanded for the sake of the church and for the sake of the kingdom uh, without ignoring real problems, but not assuming that there are problems behind every tree and behind every bush. So that sometimes there's almost a super either paranoia or supercritical spirit that doesn't allow people to see the work of God before us, uh, where there are good things. So that's one response to that. Um, all I can say is that right now I share great responsibility for one place, and I, together with the colleagues and the faculty and the students themselves, I dare say, are doing all we can to make sure that the Josephinum uh, is in conformity with all that the church and the people of God expect from a seminary, uh, preparing men for the priesthood. And so that's so really all I can say. Isn't there, a, 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 to a certain extent, a little bit of increase in second vocation? Yeah. Yes, that was the third part of that question, which really uh, deserves an answer. We've had uh, an increase over the last 15, 20 years uh, in, in the age of men and, and second career vocations. And our seminary has uh, witnessed that. Uh, if a bishop sends an older man to us, we, um, we have room. And uh, we're, happily, we're happy to receive him. And uh, we just ordained a man last year who had... Uh, been in the academic life for uh, all of his adult life, and uh, now uh, I think in his late 50s, uh, is a new young priest uh, and uh, doing wonderful work. 
so we're equipped to, to deal with that and to, and to help. Um, the oldest member of our faculty is 80 years old. So no matter how old somebody is, we have somebody just a little bit older to help guide. Uh, I think that um, uh, there used to be, it's important to say, there used to be seminaries established just for older vocations. I think a lot of seminaries now have a mix of young and old. And finally, in the last three to five years, we've noticed something, especially in the college level. More young men, 18, 19, starting. So whereas that was not even considered uh, 10 years ago, and there were vocation directors and bishops turning people away, saying, no, oh, you're just too young. Young people now are kind of pounding down the doors, not mm -hmm. in the numbers we want. That's, that's unfortunately not the case yet. But there are young people saying, well, you know, why can't I pursue this path and at least learn uh, yeah. the spiritual life and grow as best I can and study philosophy and study the languages that'll help me prepare for theology? And we have more 18, 19, 20-year-olds entering than we've had before. You know, college age appropriate uh, Which I'm beginning. Glad, I'm really glad to hear because um, I was talking to some religious orders and they were talking about they've got to finish college first before we yeah. start looking at them. And I'm thinking, wait, those are, I think of my college years, I would rather have been in a better environment than what I had to go through. We have no pretense of putting blinders on these young men. Um, they have cars, they can leave the property, uh, but we want to give them the tools of the spiritual life. They have a prayer life, uh, they have a community life, they have an intellectual life, they have academic uh, and apostolic work. They leave campus and work yeah. among the poor. And um, this past uh, month we saw 20 of them go down to uh, a foundation of the sisters, uh, the Poor Clares in Portsmouth, Ohio, to work on their property and help them prepare that uh, monastery uh, for uh, other sisters who are coming in and for visitors and guests and pilgrims. Our men are involved and active and they're off campus and they're in the world, but they also want to be immersed in a community of faith. And if there is a culture of death out there, why do we say to a young man who feels called to follow Christ, well, immerse yourself in that culture of death for a few years and then come back to us and see how you are? Well, a lot won't come back. So without trying to shelter them from the world uh, excessively, we can also equip them for the battle in Christ from an early age if they choose. All right. Thank you, Father. We're going to take a break. Back just a minute with your question for Father James Garneau. See you in a bit. Welcome back to this Open Line First Monday. Our guest this evening is Father James Garneau, the interim rector at the Pontifical College uh, Seminary jo Josephinum. Uh, I get that right, uh, PCJ. And uh, also the uh, academic dean, yes. which is a very important position. Uh, I don't mean so much in power, but I mean and, uh, in setting the direction. Sure, and uh, for the experience of professors and students. Yeah, and uh, I, on both fun. levels, on the on the college level and on the uh, uh, the level of the theology, uh, which is a graduate level program. Yeah, yeah. make sure it's uh, it's comprehensive, it's orthodox, it challenges the uh, the brightest without losing those who are struggling along the way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's take our first caller this evening. It's Howard from Delaware. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, for Father. Yes, Father, uh, why do we not, in our seminaries, train the seminarians to become spiritual directors? I find one of the great weaknesses over the years, talking to priests and looking for spiritual directors, they say, I am not trained to be a spiritual director. I thank you. Howard, thank you very much for your question. That's a wonderful question, Howard. And uh, I was a... a, a I'm a diocesan priest myself, and I had the great privilege of being a parish priest uh, for 10 years in a place called Newton Grove, North Carolina. It was a great gift to me to be there. And um, I think that um, in the past there was uh, little emphasis on training men in the seminary uh, for this very, very important work of spiritual direction. Uh, there was um, a suitable 
preparation of men to be confessors, which touches on this, uh, but to be a, a good spiritual director does demand more. Um, and that in the past, uh, it wasn't always so much of the fundamental basic program. It was, however, the focus of graduate studies for a certain number of men uh, after their four-year preparation in the seminary, but, but all too few. I think the church has relied on the religious priests uh, to be the spiritual directors, to be those to whom folks, including the priests, parish priests and Dawson priests, went uh, for that kind of uh, deeper uh, exploration of the journey. Um, and sadly, in our time, uh, with um, the diminishing number of religious, there aren't as many religious spiritual directors. Now, given those realities, uh, what about today? I think there is more emphasis on this in the um, seminary. Uh, and a, a number of the young men who've benefited from good spiritual direction that brought them to the seminary know how important that is for other people's lives. And so they want to be able to serve. And they look for opportunities to learn this craft. Um, and of course, uh, you learn, I think most fundamentally, by experiencing spiritual direction. Uh, and so you're, you're mentored in it. Um, there are courses and there are programs. Uh, we try to have some of those, at least on the basic level, at the Josephinum. Um, I think that uh, one other thing needs to be said, though, uh, on behalf of parish priests, uh, and again, falling back on my own experience of, of, of the 10 years in North Carolina uh, as a pastor, um, we're swamped. Uh, we're overwhelmed. And just to visit the sick, uh, to take care of those who are um, uh, in particular trials and uh, uh, points in their journey who need some counseling, some comfort. Um, I tried to go out and knock on doors in the neighborhood to do evangelization. And we want priests who are good evangelizers. And if you're going to be out stopping the streets, knocking on doors, then it's hard to have a schedule for spiritual direction. Um, the meetings and the organization and the, um, all the other things that a parish priest is expected to do makes it hard for him even to set aside time for this very important apostolate. Um, so I think it needs to happen, uh, and the improvement needs to happen on several levels. Continued improvement in seminary formation, um, an emphasis uh, on this, and that's going to come from people like you, Howard, who tell the priests, we need this. Mm. And that'll tell men who have a heart after the heart of Christ uh, to um, what to prepare for. And then um, uh, we need more priests. And not only priests, uh, but religious men and women, and there are a holy lay people men and women who can be prepared and trained uh, to be effective uh, companions on the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a very strong tradition in the, in the Irish church of, uh, uh, of the spiritual friend uh, that's not necessarily the ordained, uh, but who, who leads us to Christ. And so there's a lot of ways that this can be lived and experienced even still. You know, let me ask you a question about something else. that. I'm a convert to the church, and so I've kind of come right into the middle of the movie, you know, if you want to think of it that way. But it seems that in the last 40, 50 years, one of the struggles that I've encountered is that where at one time uh, there was this order that the lay Catholic could trust, whether it came to doing your confession or addressing someone, the protocol, and it made a very safe and friendly environment. And then during this time, there have been so many uh, trials and errors at different ways that sometimes we're not even sure what's the right way to do it anymore. To me, an example is you know, when I came into the church, I thought that when you met a bishop, you would kiss his ring. I mean, that, that was the protocol. Well, now sure. you just don't know how to greet a bishop anymore because some will do and some don't. Yeah. And we're kind of in the experimenting time. A bit, in issues like even doing a good confession, how does one weed their way through all the voices. Sure, it, and it's, it's the loss of, of, a, of, a, of a culture. Of course, there was never one Catholic culture. It was a multitude of Catholic cultures that intersected and touched and sometimes uh, even battled a little bit. Um, Italian Catholicism and Irish Catholicism uh, shared the fundamentals of the faith. Catholicism in, in the midst of that. And yet people bit, yeah. grew up within some, ca many, uh, not all, uh, of course, there were always converts, yeah. but uh, many grew up within some experience of cultural Catholicism, which taught you how to behave in the context. Uh, with the kind of secularization that we've experienced in the last 30 years, uh, and, and even the drive within the church in many places to, 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 to do away with remnants of the cultural Catholicism, there is great confusion. And people are kind of uh, trying to grasp and sometimes invent or reinvent um, protocol 
and aspects of that. And we have to be careful. We can't, I don't think, identify simply one place or one age that was the golden age to which we return as if the real health of the church is to be found in living on a movie set uh, or living in a history book. Um, but that learning from the past and responding to the present um, and educating people. Uh, the education, I think, that has to take place in written form, television, radio, uh, videos, preaching, uh, and that ongoing education needs to be intensified for everybody because there is so much confusion. Dig back, if you would, into your... Um, oh, here, I think we have a caller. Fine, let's take our next caller. This is Martin from Ohio. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Marcus and uh, Father... Uh, Father Garneau. Garneau. Uh, I have been bothered quite a long time by why is there so much uh, ranting and raving about abortion murder when we don't talk about the root of the evil, divorce and remarriage? Because Jesus Christ himself said that it wasn't like that always. Yeah. And he's going back to what his father said, no divorce and no remarriage. Thank you for your question. Family life is the foundation, and um, uh, you're right. It, 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 it's the starting point for, for this and a myriad of questions. Um, it's uh, the starting point for vocations in most cases, I think. Uh, the abortion question captures our attention because lives are at stake. And so when you get to that level of life and death, um, you capture the attention, at least of a good portion, and uh, we learn from all the statistics an increasing proportion of this country. Uh, thanks be to God that they're realizing what's happening here. You are wisely uh, looking for roots of the problem and uh, family life and uh, the understanding of the covenantal nature of marriage um, is, is a starting point for this. And I, I couldn't agree with you more in, in your identification of, of, of at least a good deal of the root cause of some of the greater crimes we've seen. We have come through a time when the family's been under attack, marriage has been under attack, and uh, it took courage, courageous priests to take a stand for what the church teaches in the midst sometimes of a, of a congregation that didn't want to hear it. Well, you know, you talk about ongoing conversion, and, and I remember the first time that I preached against contraception in my parish, and it took several years. Yeah. Now, in one way, that's a good thing for a parish priest to, to know his people before he he, he preaches at them, uh, to, to, to hear them, to love them, um, and to learn from them. Uh, but never to forget, uh, while you're learning from them, that you also bring the truth of the gospel and of the church. And um, uh, to preach and teach the fullness of that truth without fear, um, it's important. I, people, please, uh, I, I beg you to pray for your priests, yeah. that they would have prudence and courage. Uh, those two things. Yeah. yeah. And I forget which of the spiritual fathers emphasize so much that if, if a man is called to the priesthood, uh, if he, of, of course, is going to receive the blessings to carry out that work of Christ, but then the spiritual battle increases too. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. That constant battle. Uh -huh. Which is why the, the conversion has to be constant. Yeah. I've, I've experienced that so much in my own life. And, you know, and again, on those four pillars, if you will, the man, the human conversion that's got to go uh, on, uh, the constant reconversion of, of the whole self, uh, the intellectual conversion, you have to keep reading, keep studying. It doesn't end at the end of the four years of uh, major seminary. Uh, the pastoral conversion, keep learning how to work with people, keep learning new skills, keep learning, even while you're deepening skills that you've developed, um, you need to keep listening. Um, and then, of course, the spiritual conversion, that spiritual battle that goes on not only in the world, but in our own hearts because I do sometimes not the good I will to do, uh, but that which I don't will to do. But for the grace of God, yeah. go I. Yeah. And that's our, our rec constant affirmation and constant confession every day is to recognize God's grace in our life. We've got an, another caller, Barbie from Kentucky. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Um, well, my husband and I are actually evangelical Protestant seminary students. Oh, great. And um, it, as it looks, um, we're probably going to be coming home to Rome next Easter. Um, as we're, just kind of, we're looking right now and searching and seeking and basically running out of reasons to not be Roman yeah, Catholic. Okay. And um, anyway, right now, realizing that every translation of Scripture that I have has been translated through Protestant lenses, yes. how important is it for me to have a Catholic edition to be studying right now? Thank you, Barbie, for the question. 
Well, it, it's, it's good and important, and uh, thanks be to God, there are uh, a number of good translations of the Scripture. I wouldn't discount the beauty and the, uh, uh, the accuracy of some of the best uh, translations of the Scriptures done under Protestant auspices. Yeah. So that the Scriptures, uh, which are so loved and cherished by the Protestant community, uh, have been in many cases well translated. Now, footnotes, introductory chapters, um, those kinds of things. Yeah, the chapter on maps is, doesn't carry the same inspiration as the rest of the <laughs> that. That's for sure. And, uh, and so those are things to be more cautious of. And then within Catholicism, um, there's a variety of scripture translations, some better than others. Yeah. Um, Still committees. And uh, yeah, uh, committees have great uh, um, benefits. They also can have uh, uh, defects. And uh, because the language is changing, and if you're reading the scriptures in the vernacular, uh, in English, um, the language is always developing. Yeah. The new generation has new words or different slants on words, and so there has to be an ongoing process of revisiting the translations. Um, so being attentive to this is important. What's very important is that you have the full Bible, all 72 books, <laughs> and that's the most fundamental difference, that we teach and believe the Lord has given us um, the 72 books that we count that have been defined as being the corpus of the sacred word of God, and that uh, those Bibles which don't have those uh, texts, uh, which we do, um, while they might offer us much, don't offer the whole story. Yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good place to start. Make sure those, those scriptures are there, the so-called deuterocanonical books. In fact, one particular book, which I have come to love in those, quote, extra books that I never had, right. is the book of Sirach which is a wonderful, powerful book of wisdom, but what's neat and unique about it is that it had another name. It was called Ecclesiasticus, which means... The Church of the Church. It's the book of the Church. The yeah. early fathers recognized, the early Christian fathers yes. recognized that this book, Syriac, was the book of the Church. Yeah. There's wisdom that uh, is of the time uh, of, of the Old Testament, and then there's divine wisdom. There's yeah. inspired wisdom, which is given to us. It's revelation. And uh, you'll find a great depth and help in there for your spiritual life. All right. Email from Rachel in Ohio. How do you know that you are going through a conversion? How would I know? She asked. Usually, uh, Rachel, when I'm not comfortable, I know I'm going <laughs> through a conversion. When I'm being dragged, uh, sometimes kicking and screaming. Uh, when I haven't um, uh, lined it up. When I haven't planned for it when I haven't um, set everything in motion. Um, I, I never expected to be at a seminary. I expected after um, an opportunity I had for graduate studies, I uh, went uh, back to the Catholic University of America and got a degree in uh, church history. I expected to go back and be a parish priest. Um, in fact, I asked for that privilege and found myself uh, the next thing in Ohio uh, in a seminary. Um, the demand for my continued conversion in that context was so apparent to me uh, in the context of seminary formation uh, that um, I knew the Lord had my attention. Um, and then when there's the struggle uh, to fulfill the demands of the conversion, um, uh, sometimes the Lord might give us the grace to make the conversion easy, uh, to make uh, the embrace simpler. Uh, and that's a great grace when it happens. But, but my experience is that often enough uh, there's the awareness of what has to happen and then the, uh, the begging God for the grace to enable me to let it happen. Yeah. And that's, uh, for me, uh, those are some signs of, of, of authentic conversion. You know, and then the fruits. Of oh, course, by the yeah. fruits, you'll know them. And uh, for that, you can ask my colleagues on the faculty <laughs> and the students and to see if they've seen any signs of conversion. That's, uh, that's their judgment, not mine. This is a, an important question in many ways, and I think from my background, because there are so many Gospels out there. Yeah. And I have to say there are false gospels out there. And one of, in my mind, one of the, the false gospels that runs rampant in America and is seen on, often on television is the health and wealth gospel, which c looks at conversion always as a positive increase in feeling, a positive increase in wealth, a positive increase in assurance of faith, it's always seen that. And if you're not experiencing this positive increase, That's then you're not being converted. You're going to, and that is a false gospel. Yeah, and, and my experience is that often enough, 
uh, conversion is a stripping away. And it's, John, the it's dark a, night of the soul. It's an apparent about, loss, uh, often enough. Uh, there certainly is the joy and they're, they're as fruits. The, the joy when you've embraced the poverty. The yeah. joy when you've taken the loss at, at face value and said, okay, Lord, I didn't need that anyway, thank you. Uh, and I thought that was my comfort. I thought that was my strength. And you're right, it wasn't. You are. <laughs> and then that's the bottom line. Let me ask you two final questions. One, looking back on your pastoral experience, could you give a word of encouragement to, to the many families that watch us every week that I know from their emails who talk about the loss of family members from the church? Yeah. Some words of encouragement to them. Yeah, I, um, I, I was parish priest for, for 12 years, pastor for 10, um, and uh, I heard the story so many times. One word is, it's not over till it's over. And so th what you plant and the faith and the love that you show and it does need to be shown from the earliest days. Uh, sometimes we wonder why people have left, but they didn't get the fundamental formation at the beginning. But if you've planted the seed, and you've given the witness, and then you experience the pain of not seeing that uh, flower grow in your time, um, don't lose heart. Continue to give witness. That's so important. Uh, continue to pray, uh, and then have confidence in God and His power to save. I've seen more than one child return uh, to the faith after they've buried their parent. And how often I heard in, in eastern and rural North Carolina where I served, you know, his father would have loved to have seen him back in church. His mother would have loved to have seen him going to confession. Now he's going. Now she's going. And I, I, would, I would be able to say, they know. They know if they're in Christ in the kingdom, they know this joy and this glory. Um, so not losing heart is, is very fundamental. Um, and to continue to give witness with your whole life uh, not nagging, but giving the authentic witness of joy that Christ is transforming you that makes that conversion attractive to others. Okay. Uh, before I ask you the last question, there is an email, but I think I'll just answer it because it's a clarification. A woman uh, from Virginia is asking, what was the reading that we mentioned at the beginning of the show that referenced the early church fathers writing in addition to scripture? We're talking about the office of the readings. The office of readings. And so every day in the, in the, in the liturgy of the hours, there's a selection uh, from uh, the fathers of the church, from great saints and spiritual writers, uh, a more substantive reading, a couple of pages, an excerpt that gives us some um, stuff. The liturgy of the hours is available. It can be bought. Yeah. It should be prayed. Yeah. And the people of God are encouraged to, to pick it up. In and fact, pray. I do know that the daughters of St. Paul produced just a volume of the Office of Readings. Yes. Separate yeah. from the Christian prayer. So you could have the, 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 the one volume Christian prayer and the one volume Office, Office of, Readings, of Readings. Which has a more extended reading uh, from the scripture and an extended reading from the fathers and the saints yeah. each day. Yeah. You mean you go through the whole Bible and it's, in, it's, in it's two good, years, it's I good think, stuff. from that? If, yes. If in it, that in the Mass? You would, almost. Just, and, and with the Mass, yes, almost the whole, the would, whole thing. Yes. The whole thing. Final question, and back to this issue of continuing conversion then, in a practical sense. I mean, you've gone through pastoral work, and then now you've been brought into leadership, and often there's a different challenges, and there you are now acting rector of a seminary, a pontifical seminary here in the United States. How do you practically, and think of this as, as advice to our, our God, how do you practically keep that continuous conversion happening? Each person has a different techniques. So, uh, I get up earlier. Um, I, uh, I try to get some time before the pace of the day really picks up. And I get a little time for myself and for myself with the Lord. And uh, that's uh, life-giving for me, uh, to make sure I'm still listening and to allow people in significantly into my life. So friendships and uh, those I serve to listen to what they're saying to me and my colleagues. Um, and so those um, sources of God's love and uh, revelation are helpful. Thank you, Father. Running out of time, how about a quick blessing? For us? I will be glad to. May Almighty God continue to bless and nourish and keep and protect all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Garneau, thank you very much for thank joining you very us much, on the journey home. Thank you for your witness and for your work at the Josephinum and also your reminder of our need for continual conversion. You know, we can take our, our faith with Jesus for granted and the constant need for looking at him and surrendering and accepting his grace and his guidance in our life. Thank you very much for your witness and what you're doing for the seminarians there. And thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure. God bless. We'll see you again next week.